So, thanks. Thank you, Chase, for being here. If you see him, uh, encourage him. His uh, daughter is scheduled for surgery. Where where Jeannie go? This week, I I got an email and I couldn't remember what exactly day it was. She's going down to Riley. If you don't know, they had twin baby girls, um, and Ellie is the smaller of the two. She's uh, is she a month old? It's got to be at least a month, and uh, she still only weighs four pounds. So she's a little itty bitty girl, um, and she has a hole in her heart that needs surgery. Um, so if you can imagine a four pound baby having surgery, that uh, I'm I'm glad there are skilled people in the world who can do that. Um, and and we praise God for Ellie, and it's been a, a tough go for Chase and Kelsey, and they've handled it beautifully. So we we're excited about that. Um, 1941, C.S. Lewis began putting out a series of correspondences uh, that would later be uh, put together as a book that is one of his most famous, still read to this day, known as the Screwtape Letters. Anybody heard of it? You ever, you ever read the book? It is a fictional dialogue between two demons. The elder, uh, Screwtape, and he's sending letters to his younger nephew, Wormwood, trying to instruct him on how to be effective in his tempting of Christians. What types of things should he do to pull people away from their faith? And that's really the root of the book, is that question, what would the forces of Satan want for the lives of Christians that would pull them away from God? It's a great book. I'd encourage you to go read it. Um, however... <laughs> Bonnie has it for you if you need to borrow. Um, it was written very uh, with a context in mind. 1941, uh, when Lewis started, right in the middle of World War II in Great Britain. And he writes to, to that context very pointedly. With that in mind, I thought I'd take the same premise, the same thought, and try to bring that idea to our current context. So here you have uh, Wormwood and screw tape for us today. My dear Wormwood, it's been some time since our last correspondence, but I'm thrilled to hear about your new assignment in the United States and your request for your assistance in effective tempting in a new environment. Since you do not have a specific patient yet, I'll keep my instructions broad so they may be applied to any situation in which you are placed. As a junior tempter still looking to advance through our ranks, there are a few tried and true methods for American Christians you should be sure to employ. It may seem wise to lean into creativity in your tempting, but there's a place for creativity, particularly with the increasing world of technology. But do not stray too far from our usual paths. They've served us well and have no reason to believe they will not work still. Do not be troubled by the American Christian's thin veneer of confidence, for there is really a simple strategy that keeps them from being effective that I can sum up in one word, distraction. The fight with them is not one we approach head on. They, after all, have access to forces far greater than our own if we were to conduct an all-out frontal assault. Rather, we simply keep moving the shiny objects that grab their attention and keep them from what is important. Your work is that of distraction. Constantly keeping from them, keeping them from dwelling on all the enemy has to offer. And to accomplish this, I offer three specific suggestions. Firstly, entertainment. Entertainment will be a well that you return too frequently as a tempter in America. It's so effective that some tempters believe it's too easy, and in some ways they are correct. For in your task of distraction, entertainment is king. Every one of your possible patients carries an object in their pocket with unlimited access to the entire history of human thought. That could sound like an obstacle to our goals, but not to worry. Instead of using that object to access deeper thoughts of our enemy, they use it to fill every tiny cavity of space in their life with amusement. Place as many of these devices in their life as you possibly can. They will do the rest. Scrolling through images of unattainable lives and playing foolish games filled with tasks that are meaningless, they live the bulk of their existence chasing after things that have no value. Your investment in this arena will yield a plentiful harvest. Entertainment begets entertainment, and their actions prove that there has never been a more fertile ground for our cause in their lives than the never-ending stream of videos, pictures, articles, and news that's actually just more entertainment. They consume it constantly, producing mild laughs and hours void of brain activity. Don't let this tool ever depart from your hand. 
It is entirely irrelevant which particular patient you are eventually assigned. They are all addicted to entertainment. Parents fill their children's heads with more movies and TV than anything else, and by the age of seven, those children are more competent in the use of the entertainment devices than their parents. The younger adults are continually delaying responsibility in favor of years in front of a screen. The older adults rationalize their lazy evenings every week by telling themselves, I've worked hard and deserve to not think when I get home. The elders of their country have checked out from life entirely, believing they have a right to retire and seek the mind-numbing pleasures they could not fully chase in their youth. You see, your great task is not the act of filling their minds with all sorts of devious thoughts in service of our cause, but merely to keep the thoughts of the truth of our enemy's love from them. It doesn't take long. Even those desiring to live in complete service to the enemy will starve themselves when their minds do not dwell on that truth. They quickly become lethargic and dry in their pursuit of the enemy and are almost entirely ineffective in stopping our cause. Secondly, busyness. Your battlefield sees very little battle because they are too busy doing other things. Even a cursory glance at one of their calendars shows there's so little space in their lives that they cannot possibly have time to focus on anything, especially the enemy's offers of grace. There are many theories for their addiction to busyness. Largely, the reasons for their constant occupation are unimportant, as long as the busyness remains at a barely sustainable pace that lingers on the edge of collapse at any moment. However, even with the variety of motivations for filling calendars, I believe we can understand, and subsequently take advantage of, one common reality of Americans' busy obsession. Uncertainty. The American life through the last 60 years has been relatively stable, but lurking under their cultural stability is a deathly fear of not being in control. They are drunk on their own independent spirit and are terrified of losing personal sovereignty. Incapable of facing uncertainty in life, they fill every moment with tasks, to keep from facing the hard questions, and as the uncertainty builds, busyness is inserted as a socially acceptable distraction. The busyness gives way to exhaustion, and exhaustion almost always leads to selfishness. This is an ideal situation, of course. They easily convince themselves that they are altruistic because they are busy, all the while building the vice of selfishness instead of the virtue of selflessness, and through the haze of self-deception are unable to see that they are even more distracted. They live from notification to notification with chimes that hollowly ring out announcing they're late for their next appointment. The unrelenting calendar keeps their head down and keeps their head down in their work as the enemy gifts the enemy offers go unattended. They're like children on a train reading a book about mountains and never bothering to look out the window and see the mountain range that lives in front of them. Now there's a portion of the population that finds themselves in the opposite pole of busyness, crippling laziness. But I doubt that you will be assigned a patient in this category, for they usually need no tempting from anyone other than themselves. Third, and finally, disagreement. For a group of people that think so little, they belligerently argue their opinions a lot. Whenever possible, you should stoke the flames of disagreement. Convince your patient that their anger is righteous, and they, they will be helping a society by exposing their opponent's errors. It does not matter if these errors are ethical, factual, or fictional. What's important is the disagreement. We must be careful here, for there's room for disagreement to be motivated by understanding and love, but we are obviously steering patients not toward disagreement in general, but towards a particular kind of disagreement, disagreement that is fueled by pride. If you can convince your patient that they are without a doubt in the right, and the other person has nothing to offer to their perspective, they will disagree with a unique ability for belittling and dividing. Most of the groundwork has been laid for you. Their culture has been on a slow boil, increasing to the point of combat, which means almost all disagreements turn in the favorable direction of hostility. They are seemingly incapable of hearing someone think different without hammering out rebuttals on message boards and disparaging the character of their opponent. Keep these points of tension in full view of your patient at all times. Culture can lull into peace, at which time we allow their fire to burn out and the church militant to become toothless. The culture can also erupt into conflict, at which time we remove the fire from the fireplace and attempt to burn the whole house down, leaving the church militant disoriented and combative. You are currently in the latter state, stoke in antipathy instead of apathy, and in their rage they will lose sight of anything that unites them to each other or our enemy. These are our tried and true tactics. Distraction through entertainment, 
busyness, and disagreement. You may branch out from time to time, but keep distraction front and center as it keeps them from what is important, and in the void they run to one of two desirable extremes. First, belief that they are too broken to fix. Second, belief that they need no fixing. When we distract them from what's important, we are able to erode what little foundation of faith existed. Keep at the work. Your affectionate uncle. Screw tape. Difficult to listen to? It was hard to write. I found my life in the crosshairs of what I think the enemy would want over and over again. Pulling my thoughts away from things that are important, I, I live a distracted life. And it's a constant battle for us to, to keep what's of value and what's important as first priority. To not allow things to, to take our mind away from what we should be focusing on. We're in our second week of Lent, the time period leading up to Easter. If there was ever a time as a follower of Christ to make sure that your mind is not distracted, this is it. I know in some other uh, church traditions, they give things up for Lent. A lot of times, evangelicals and, and particularly Baptists are, uh, I don't want to say scared, but... Uh, against anything that another tradition does because it's from the other tradition. And I understand the reasons, but sometimes we need to, to see value where value is and to think about what it means. And, and this period of time leading up to Easter to try and say, I want to be focused on God in a way that I don't normally. To set aside the distractions of this life, whether it be my phone or food or or relationships, whatever it may be, I, I need to be reminded. I need to put distraction aside. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 this morning. If you missed our uh, first hour, our Sunday school hour, I, I told the group there, um, I, I was kind of caught in a little bit of a bind. We finished our New Year's emphasis in Romans chapter 12, and I had planned to go back into Genesis, which we'd been going through. I think I'm in chapter 25, if my memory serves me. Um, and I would planned to just jump back into Genesis, but then we had something planned for, for Palm Sunday and for Easter Sunday, and I felt like just trying to jump into Genesis for four weeks and then taking a two-week break would, would be a little difficult so instead, I decided to take the, the theme of our uh, Passion Week that we're doing, which is uh, just titled Reconciled with the subtitle Relationship Restored, and taking that and kind of extending it backwards. And I'll, I'll get to more of that in just a second. But for this morning, let's begin in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 through 21. Therefore... If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore to you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we approach uh, this season of the year, leading up to an empty tomb. We ask for your guidance and proper thinking to help us be followers of you who are mindful of what that means and are not simply passive as to what's happening in our life of faith, but are intentionally striving towards you to 
to dwell in the richness of your mercy in more profound ways. We ask for that to, to come from this text this morning, Lord. Please speak to us mightily through the word. Would you help me just to, to be an accurate communicator of what you have already revealed? We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, I've already alluded to two of them, but this passage and, and this series really came about because of a convergence of, of three different things. First, what I read to you as an introduction. The, the distraction that happens so frequently in our lives that we have to combat. And if I were to pick a passage, this would be one of my favorites to help us remind us what's important. Secondly, um, I've titled this, Why Christ Part 2. There was a long break between Part 1 and Part 2. The first, Why Christ, was the very first message that I preached here, Easter Sunday, two years ago. And I asked the question, why do we make such a big deal out of Jesus? Well, we just started a church, and it was, it was kind of our first, you know, uh, service. We would kind of started in January, and we'd had a Sunday a couple weeks previously where just a few of us took communion together and, and prayed and asked God to work mightily here in this place. Um, but our first Sunday that was open to the public was on Easter Sunday of 2016. Right? I have that right? And the title was, Why Christ? So we're picking up that same line of thinking. Why do we as a church make such a big deal about this time of year? Why are we so focused on this the cross that we literally just put right in the middle of the room? Why do we care so much about the empty grave? Why? Why about all this? Why, what are we doing? So the first thing, the introduction about trying to fight distraction. The second, uh, the continuation of, of our, our foundational message, if you will, here. And then third, what I told you already uh, about the theme that our staff put together for Passion Week of, of Reconciled. And if there was one passage that you're going to preach on to talk about reconciliation, this is it. I don't know if you noticed, it's mentioned five times in our text. And we'll get to that in just a second. But we're... We're trying to ask the broad question, why Christ? What, what are we doing? And I, and I believe answering that it gets at all three of my points of convergence. It helps us from distraction. It gets to the foundation of why we're here, why we began there as a church, and brings us to the truth of reconciliation. When we answer the question of why Christ, we, we can't help but find the answer to all of those, at least in part. If you were to ask that question, why, why did Christ come? Why do we care so much about Christ? The, the Bible offers quite a few answers to that. I, I just jotted down a few. You don't need to turn there because you probably won't be able to keep up. Uh, 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2, Christ came to be an advocate for sinners. John 1, 14, Christ came to show the glory of God. Romans 3, 24 through 25, Christ came to appease God's wrath. John 6, 35, Christ came to be bread. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30, to Christ came to bring the holiness to a broken world. Ephesians 5, 1 through 2, Christ came as the personification of God's love. Hebrews 1, 3, Christ came to reveal God. Matthew 20, 28, Christ came to be a servant. John 10, 10, Christ came to give life. There's many things that go into this question. And, and they all kind of go together. And, and so... I can't chase them all. I've got six weeks to do this, right? You just heard me read about eight passages. There's no way I can even touch on all of that. So I tried to, to bring us to what's really important. What, what will help us avoid that, that temptation of distraction? What will sure up our foundation? What will elucidate the truth of reconciliation the best? And for that, as I said, we begin in 2 Corinthians 5. Now, this morning, uh, I'm going to start answering the, the why Christ question. Um, and I'm, I have six different answers in the next six coming weeks. This morning's, why did Christ come? The answer is to be your substitute. Next week, to be your righteousness. The week after that, to be your example. The week after that, to be your priest. Fifth week, which is Palm Sunday, he came to be your Messiah. And on Easter Sunday, he came to be your resurrected king. 
So that's where we're going. I, I've, hopefully I've, I've talked about it from several different angles. I hope that helps you understand the thought process and what's going on. Um, but this morning we get to begin with a hallmark biblical passage on reconciliation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are going to fight distraction together. Let's look at the text. Before I get to the uh, answer of this morning of substitute, it's the last verse in our text, we have to, to build to it. So what, what's here first? Starting in verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. What a truth right out the gate. The broken old me in Christ is made new. It, you could probably stop right there. Just read that verse every single week. Come back, throw our hands up in the air, our head back and praise God. I've been made new. It, it's right, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new. Solomon didn't know Christ. <laughs> Not in this way. You changed your entire being. Paul says it in, in the famous verse in Galatians 2, right? I've been crucified with Christ. That old part of me is dead. It's no longer there. The life I now live, I live in Christ. I am a new person. And what does, how, how is this accomplished? Continuing on, verse 18, all of this is from God. Let's pause right there. Reconciliation is from God. We want to start and understand uh, why Christ came. We've been looking at the big picture of, of reconciliation. This morning, the specific element of Him being a substitute. We begin in this passage to help us understand reconciliation is from God. Its foundation, its impetus, its beginning, all of it is God. This isn't me deciding, you know what? I, me and God are on the rocks. We, we, need to, we need to heal this broken relationship. No. God says, I am going to heal. You and your stubborn frustration said, no, I don't want any part of that. You are completely unable, apart from God, to move towards reconciliation. It is Him who starts the movement. Therefore, all of this is from God. Moving on. Who, through Christ, reconciled us to Himself. Pause again. First thing, reconciliation is from God. Second, reconciliation is extended to us. You see there, right, in verse 18, it, it began with God, but it was never intended to stop there. Reconciliation always had a purpose, and that's you. That, that's the created order being brought back into right relationship, healing the broken bonds of the fall. Third, continuing on, it is reconciliation is from God, it is extended to us. Third, reconciliation is expected from us. You see in verses 18, 19, and 20, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. You have been made new. And as a reconciled person, you now take up the mantle of being a reconciler. I don't get to just rest in the great thing of God healing me. I, I can't stop there. That great truth of being made new and God lights a fire in me that says, I, I have to go and also let other people know they can be reconciled. God has given me the the great ministry to continue what he began in me. Fourth, 
You saw it already. I read in verse 19. Reconciliation is through the forgiving of sins. Verse 19, that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Your brokenness, your sinfulness, God Almighty forgives. Through Christ, he, he takes that ledger of your broken, uh, incapable, ugly self, and he wipes it clean. Reconciliation is from God, extended to us, expected from us, and is through the forgiveness of sins. This is the big picture, the, the hallmark of reconciliation, of God healing. And all of the pieces are necessary. You cannot have a reconciliation that is from God extended to us and through the forgiving of sins and not expect for you to take up that ministry. Similarly, you cannot take up the ministry of reconciliation if you yourself have not been reconciled. They go together, two sides of the same coin. You cannot separate them. Now, to get at the meat of uh, what I was trying to aim at this morning, all of that fairly extended introduction. How? Right? How is that possible? There's no way, you, you can't just say, God forgives, to, to use the language of, of Romans chapter 3, how can God, God be just and the justifier? How is that even possible? For God to look down and say, your sins are forgiven. You, you like the sound of that when it's applied to you, right? Now try to apply it to somebody else. God, I mean, put it in the courtroom as a judge knows you're guilty, all the evidence is there, you confess and says, you know what, it's okay. There's nothing just about that. That is unjust in every way. Pick the vilest of people you can think of. I don't know who's at the top, the top of the list this week, probably Nicholas Cruz, right? Young man walked into a high school, decided he was going to kill the kids he went to school with. Now can you imagine the outrage in our country, if the day comes when he stands up in court and the judge says, it's okay. This place would burn, man. People would be furious at the lack of justice. How can God be just? How can God even possibly claim to be just? Our sin demands punishment. He, he can't be a, a good judge who sits there and looks at all of your brokenness and says, you know what, I forgive. You heard me read in Psalm chapter 51 this morning as an opening to our service. David was conceived in sin. He doesn't mean that he's illegitimate from his mother. He, he means that at that his very beginning, at the very moment of his existence, be, before he's even taken a breath in this world, he was sinful. He's born in a sinful nature. He deserves punishment. The judge to look and say, you have, you've sinned. Your punishment is eternal condemnation. Next, the gavel hits the... What is there a thing? What's the thing that the gavel hits? What's that called? It's that thing. I don't know. That, that's what we all deserve, right? Condemnation from birth. Just, you don't have to teach a child to be selfish. They know how. They, there is no struggle with teaching sin. John Calvin put it, I am covered with sin from the tip of my head to the top of my toe. Every, every inch of me. How can God be just and just say, you're forgiven? The 
answer, you have a substitute. You have somebody else who stepped in and said, I will take the punishment. You see it in verse 21. This great truth, you've been made new, you, you've been reconciled to God, it began with Him, it's extended to you, it's expected from you. All of this, it's, it's a great truth, it's through the forgiveness of sins. How? For our sake, He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Why Christ? Why do we make such a big deal out of Jesus around here? Because he stepped in to take the punishment that was mine. This isn't a very popular Rob up there. We were just talking. <laughs> He's going to be a part of a memorial service this week. And it's at a church that it doesn't want to talk about punishment. Because that's not a nice thing. We, we talk about love and mercy. You've gotten this uh, twice in the last four weeks, because the last time I preached here, I, in Romans, the end of Romans 12, I got to share this as well. Every sin will be punished. There is not a single sin, a single lapse of judgment, one momentary failure that will not go unpunished. There's just a question of where. At the foot of the cross on Christ or at the great white throne judgment in the end of time? God does not justify the godly. He justifies the broken, the incomplete, the, the malfunctioning, the you. How? Because Christ steps in for you. It is every bit as scandalous as somebody taking the punishment for Nicholas Cruz, right? Whether it be 80 to life or, or the death penalty and somebody else steps in and says, I love him so much, I will bear that penalty. This is what Christ does for you. Why Christ? Because at the cross, God looks down on Christ and sees your sin. And for eternity, God looks down on you and sees Christ's righteousness. It's the greatest trade you've ever made in your entire life. Through faith in Him. Because you couldn't fix your problem. You hear it in the language of Paul in Philippians 3, right? Starting in verse 8, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Notice this point. Not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law. I didn't live a perfect life. But that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. Why Christ? Because, because He jumps in and steps in your place. If you've been in church, it, you may have heard this message many times or you may have not heard it many times. We need the, the truth of, of the substitutionary atonement that Christ steps in where we belong, unites us to Him, and we use big words in the church sometimes. Try not to be thrown off by those. Just trying to be precise in our description. The language that's used is imputed righteousness. Christ then gives you His righteousness and you give Christ your sin. Wow. What a trade. Why Christ? Because as Peter puts it, by his wounds you were healed. He took the wrath of God for you. 
You want to begin to understand reconciliation. You want to begin to, to move well into the Easter season. You start right here knowing that what you deserved Christ took and what you would never deserve Christ gave. You stand but a beggar, right? How, how did we say it just a little while ago in the hymn? Let me read it off the word. I'm going to make sure I don't mess it up. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. That's the message. That's the reconciliation. I, I offer nothing. I, I show up at the cross as a beggar, empty-handed. And God lavishes on me riches that I could have never known. What an amazing truth. Christ steps in where I belong. Why Christ? Because he is your substitute. You can be made new through reconciliation that starts from God, is extended to you, is expected from you through the forgiveness of sins that is made possible by Christ taking your place. Without it, you and I have no chance. None. We were conceived in sin. Right from the very get-go, I needed Christ. This is where we begin our proper understanding of Easter. And this is how we step into the deep waters of reconciliation. This is how you fight the, that distraction, what the enemy wants to pull you away from. You remember the end? You end up in one of two desirable extremes, belief that you're too broken to fix or belief that you need no fixing. At the cross, both notions are dispatched entirely. There is no such thing as too broken to fix. For Christ, being of infinite worth, being God himself, God incarnate, has infinite value and therefore his life can save infinitely. And at the same time, when you show up at the cross, there is no pride it's impossible. You come naked, undesirable, worth nothing, and God gives you His righteousness anyway. That's where we begin. How we move properly to Easter, to the empty grave. You want to celebrate well, understand what we're celebrating. I hope that as we continue through this, the great truths of, of reconciliation will breathe new life into tired lungs of faith. Revitalize us, remind us of what we've been saved from, of who we worship and why. This is not just another social thing we do. Again, as Rob and I were just talking this morning about a, a church that didn't want to talk about sin and punishment, that, that sort of Christianity is dying in America. The, the nominal, I, I go to church just because. And to that I say, good riddance. I, I want no part of that. This is not that. This, this is beauty beyond comprehension that God Almighty reached out to me. It's not just be nice and, and you know, be a good neighbor and probably don't steal from your boss. It's far deeper than that. You are a new creation in Christ. That is something worth celebrating. To remind us who you are, who you were, and what Christ has done for you. That will lead us to a proper understanding on Easter morning. I hope we get there. I hope you'll come with me. Let's ask God some help in that right now. Let's pray. Lord, we praise your name for it's worthy of praise.